Hi guys, and welcome to this special lecture course on classical mechanics and relativity. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture, I want to do something a bit different. I want to talk about quantum mechanics. Of course, this course is supposed to be about classical mechanics, but where does classical mechanics come from? In the previous lectures, we looked at the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulations of classical mechanics and derived them from the principle of least action, showing that they were equivalent to Newton's laws. But where does this come from, from a more microscopic perspective? Can we derive classical mechanics? Of course, Newton's second law is basically an axiom of classical mechanics. This is just part of the theory that is put in by hand. It's the result of an experimental observation. But can we derive classical mechanics from more microscopic theory? And of course, the more fundamental theory in question should be quantum mechanics. So it turns out that's exactly what you can do. And we'll be discussing that in this lecture. How does classical mechanics emerge from the quantum world? When we consider the motion of a particle moving from one point to another, in the classical world, it takes a particular path and we can determine that path using the principle of least action. We think about different paths, so we assign each of them a classical action and we pick the path that has the least action. From quantum mechanics, a particle can take any possible path. Each of those paths actually is taken in some sense by the particle. We can zoom out and go back to the classical world by considering the quantum interference between all of those different paths. And what we'll see in this lecture, and this is a derivation due to Feynman, is that the classical path is the one that has constructive quantum interference between all of those different quantum paths. All of the other incorrect or crazy classical paths are the ones that have destructive quantum interference and therefore cancel out. Those are not the ones we observe. So all of this is to be understood through Feynman's uh, path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. And using this in this lecture, we're gonna derive the principle of least action and hence all of classical physics. I think this is one of the most deep and interesting stories in the entirety of physics, how classical mechanics itself comes about from quantum mechanics. So let's get down to it. In this lecture, we'll be discussing the connection between classical and quantum mechanics, and we'll be using the principle of least action and the Lagrangian framework uh, to understand that. First though, I want to set the scene by reminding you of another variational principle that you may have encountered in optics, the so-called principle of least time, or Fermat's principle. This variational principle in optics is actually a consequence of another principle, of Huygens' principle, where we decompose a wavefront of light, propagating in some particular direction, as an array of point sources aligned perpendicular to this direction of propagation. So according to Huygens' principle, the wavefronts that I've indicated here, moving from left to right, which constitute the wave, can be regarded as a set of point sources. And each one of these point sources emits spherical wavefronts. So you can imagine around each of these point sources, I have these spherical waves emanating. So they're the spherical waves emanating from one of them. Let's draw the spherical wavefronts emanating from another one and so on. But the point is that every single one of these point sources along this wavefront is associated with these, uh, with these spherical wavefronts. And so when I draw these all on top of each other, you see that there's a lot of intersecting lines. In fact, the idea is that we have a superposition of all of these different spherical waves from each of the different point sources and these produce constructive and destructive interference, and the in interference pattern resulting from all of these spherical waves due to a whole line of these uh, point sources is exactly the, uh, the straight line wavefronts pictured on the left. Although the light can travel in all different directions in this construction, in different directions and in different paths, because of the concept of constructive and destructive interference, we end up with a situation of parallel wavefronts and the wave of light moving from left to right. It takes the shortest path in a straight line. 
From this construction, we can now argue Fermat's principle. Suppose that light travels from a point A to a point B by any and all possible paths, unrestricted by the laws of optics. The total amplitude of light at a point is the sum of the amplitudes from all the different ways that light can travel to that point. The lengths of the different paths from A to B will in general vary by an amount, let's call it delta L, which is greatly in excess of one wavelength of the light, lambda. That's because the light has very short wavelength. Therefore, the light arriving at point B will have a very, very large range of different phases due to the different paths taken. In general, the superposition of all of these multitude of waves interferes destructively, and therefore the total amplitude is close to zero. However, and here's the important point, the path with the minimum length, let's call it L min, is special. To first order, changing the path by a tiny amount does not change its overall length, dL is equal to zero, by definition. Neighbouring paths vary in length only by dL squared. That's what we mean by the minimum path length. Phase differences of the neighbouring paths at around the minimum path length are therefore small, and these waves arriving at the endpoint B must interfere constructively. And these dominate the contribution to the total amplitude. The shortest path is therefore the one along which light is observed to travel. This correct path, the, which has the minimum path length, is of course the path uh, traversed in the least time, and hence we have Fermat's principle, the principle of least time. So this is a variational principle, and it really has the same flavour as the principle of least action in classical mechanics. So the principle of least time actually implies all of the fundamental laws of optics. For example, uh, the propagation of light in a straight line in one medium, which is the one we just discussed. In this case, the path with the shortest length is also the path with the shortest time. However, we can easily concoct a scenario where the path with the shortest length is not the one with the shortest time, and actually light travels by the path that has the shortest time, not the shortest length. And of course, this is the situation described by Snell's law in our second example. This is where we have a change in the direction of the propagation of light when going from a medium with one refractive index, let's call it N1, to a medium with a different refractive index, let's call it N2, across this interface. So light striking the interface at a particular angle from medium N1 emerges into medium 2 at a different angle. This is again entirely a consequence of the principle of least time. It's because the light travels at different speeds in the two media. The shortest path would be a straight line, but that is not the path that's, that's observed to be taken by the light. And thirdly, the law of reflection. In this scenario, Light strikes a reflective surface with equal angles of incidence and reflection. So this angle here, theta, is the same as this angle here, theta. And finally, let's consider the phenomena of diffraction. Imagine that we have some light waves approaching a barrier with a narrow slit in it. We know, as with water waves in a bathtub, that we get the phenomenon of diffraction. This is again something that's completely explicable from Huygens' construction, where we break down the wavefront into a set of point sources. If we block some of those point sources from getting through, and we're just left essentially with one point source here, in the middle of the, uh, of the narrow slit here, um, then we can basically imagine this point source producing these spherical wavefronts, and we get the phenomenon of diffraction. So this is what happens when you block some of the possible paths. When we don't let all possible paths from A to B interfere, we get diffraction. By blocking some of the paths, we change the interference pattern, and we get a different result. This is basically the way of understanding the phenomenon of diffraction 
So now I'd like to take the second of these examples, Snell's law, and explain the sense in which it can be explained by a variational principle. From the Huygens principle, we imagine that the light is decomposed into myriad point sources, and when the light is travelling from A to B, it can take any and all paths from A to B. These paths, however, uh, differ in length, and therefore differ in phase as the light arrives at the destination point B. The path traversed in the shortest time is the one that has constructive interference with neighbouring paths. That's the variational principle. All of the other incorrect paths, if you like, they just interfere destructively with their neighbouring paths. And therefore, the path that the light is observed to take is the one along the path with minimum time. And once we have this principle of minimum time, Fermat's principle, we can easily solve um, in different situations for the actual trajectory. So let's quickly apply this variational principle to obtain Snell's law. And actually, the way we'll do this is by a simple classical analogy. Imagine that you are a lifeguard at the beach and you see a drowning swimmer. You've got to reach them in the shortest possible time, but how do you get there? What path do you take? And of course, your intuition tells you that the best path to reach the swimmer in the shortest time is not a straight line. You don't need variational calculus or Snell's law to tell you that. And that's because the speed uh, that you can run along the beach is much, much quicker than the speed you can swim in the ocean. And therefore, you need to take that into account in choosing your route. So what route do you take? Well, intuitively, you know it's going to be something like this. But how do we optimise this route to get to the swimmer in the least possible time? Well, let me very quickly sketch the proof. Let's say that the distance of the swimmer from us is a distance y along the beach and a distance x in the perpendicular direction. So let's break this up further into the path along the beach and the path in the water. Furthermore, let me denote the angle here as theta 1. That's the angle as the lifeguard approaches the water's edge. And then this different angle here, theta 2, is the angle uh, as the, the lifeguard enters the water and heads towards the swimmer. Finally, let's call the path length along the beach, L1, and the path length in the water, L2. So, a bit of uh, Pythagoras and trigonometry tells us that uh, L1 is equal to the square root of x1 squared plus y1 squared, while L2 is the square root of x2 squared plus y2 squared. So the total amount of time for the entire journey, I will call t, is, of course, the distance uh, in the first parts of the journey, L1, divided by the speed that you can travel along the beach, let's call that V1, plus the distance in, uh, travelled in the water, L2, divided by the speed of travel in the water, let's call that V2. So to optimise this route, we need to find the path with the minimum time, and let's choose uh, our optimization parameter to be this y1 here. That's basically saying, at what point do I leave the beach and get into the water? I want to find the minimum time for the route as I vary y1, and the condition for that, of course, is that dt by dy1 is equal to zero. However, we have to be a little bit careful because, of course, x1 and x2 and y1 and y2 are not independent parameters. We have a fixed distance between the lifeguard and the swimmer. And so what we really have is d by dy1 of, and then it's l1 over v, that's the square root of x1 squared plus y1 squared over v1 plus L2, and this is x2 squared plus, and because we're differentiating here with respect to y1, we want to translate this y2 here into something involving y1, so that's clearly just y minus y1 squared. That's the thing that we're differentiating with respect to, and y2 implicitly depends on y1. And that's divided by the velocity v2. OK, so we can easily do this, uh, this derivative. And we can now convert this back into y2, if we like. 
And now we can do a little bit of trigonometry and recognize that uh, the sine of the angle theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And therefore, finally, we have um, this first term is basically sine theta 1 over v. The second term is simply sine theta 2 over v2. That's all equal to zero, so I can just set these things equal to each other. And that's basically Snell's law. In particular, if I write the velocity v1 as the speed of light c divided by the refractive index of medium 1, uh, which is n1, and the speed v2 as c over n2, then I simply obtain Snell's law in the usual form. And there we have it. So this is just a little sketch, an example of how we can use a variational principle, uh, such as the principle of least time, to obtain the correct classical path. In this example, we were talking about optics, uh, but this is a more general idea. However, let's bring it back now and remind ourselves that the origin of this variational principle was the idea of interfering pathways. The origin of Fermat's principle of least time is that light takes any and all pathways, and that the best path, the one with the shortest time, is the one which has constructive interference of neighbouring paths. We have destructive interference for all the other paths, and that's because the phases associated with those other paths uh, vary significantly from path to path. OK, so what's all of this got to do with quantum mechanics? Well, suppose it was the same kind of thing for mechanics as for light. A particle chooses the correct path by really taking all possible paths, and interference effects basically select the one with the minimum action. In that case, we'd predict the phenomena of diffraction for mechanical processes involving material objects if we put blocks in the way of certain paths that prevent the object from exploring all the different possible pathways. Sounds crazy? Well, of course, the miracle of it all is that this is exactly what happens. This really is what happens on the microscopic scale, as predicted by the laws of quantum mechanics, and as seen directly in experiments of, for example, electrons or neut neutrons, accelerated and fired towards a slit in a screen. So in this experiment, we have these electrons, let's say, and they're fired towards this screen, and their trajectory is apparently bent, and the particle ends up somewhere on this screen, having obviously been diffracted. Of course, drawing trajectories like this is actually a little bit misleading, because if we really observe the electron at every point to obtain a line like this, a trajectory line like this, uh, then, of course, there is no quantum interference effect. Uh, we don't think about the particle as a wave, we think about it as a particle, and then we don't have any diffraction effects. We just find all of the particles end up directly behind uh, the slit on the screen here. So we actually have to not observe the particle in order to get the diffraction pattern. And when we do that, we see that the particle ends up at a range of uh, displacements on the, the back screen here. In the early days of quantum mechanics, these experiments were really done with electrons. However, in more modern times, experimentalists uh, in working in physics have really pushed the boundaries here and used larger and larger objects fired through tiny uh, slits and seen diffraction patterns. For example, uh, buckyballs, or C60 molecules, have been observed to be diffracted, and even large uh, molecules like DNA molecules and proteins have been observed to be diffracted. But of course, truly macroscopic objects are apparently not diffracted, they behave in a classical way, and we'll see why that is shortly. Much more interesting and subtle physics is obtained in the double slit experiment. Here, we fire our electron towards a barrier with two slits in it, and we imagine that the electron can pass through either of these slits. At some later time, the particle is found somewhere along the back screen. So its start point and its end point are known, but what path did it take? Which slit does it go through? This might remind you of the problem we started out by discussing in classical mechanics. We know the start point and the end point of a particle's trajectory through space, but what path does it take? There, we considered all possible paths, however crazy, and we picked the one with the least action. Here, we apparently have a much simpler kind of problem, 
because the particle can only take one of two paths through either of the two slits. But in quantum mechanics, we allow the particle to actually travel through both of the slits as if it was a wave. In a quantum sense, it's in a superposition of passing through one slit and through the other slit. In particular, then, we can get quantum interference of the different paths as the electron passes through the slits. And this leads to um, an interference pattern of the electrons arriving on the back wall. If we really were dealing with waves, then this would be very easy to understand. The interference pattern seen on the back wall is basically the amplitude of the waves due to two effective point sources at the slit positions. With light or water waves, we basically get that from the Huygens construction we discussed earlier. But of course, this classical picture is not really what happens. We're not dealing with pure waves, like uh, waves in a bathtub. Here, the electrons really go through one at a time. These uh, amplitudes that I mentioned before, here are really probability amplitudes of the particle arriving on the back wall. But we can count the electrons as they arrive on the back wall. They are discrete individual objects. So for example, uh, at a given moment in time, maybe we see an electron arrives on the back wall over here, maybe later on one arrives here, and then another one arrives here, and one down here, and so on. And it's the probability density of uh, these particles at a given point along that screen that accumulates over time and produces this interference uh, pattern. So, since the particles go through one at a time, as shown here, the observed pattern can only be explained if each particle goes somehow through both of the slits. It has to behave like a wave that fills space and interacts with itself. This interference process defines the probability of a particle being found on the screen sometime later. So unlike our classical problem of choosing the path here we have to consider two paths simultaneously to get the right answer. So it's really not like multiple electrons are interfering with each other, rather it's like one electron is interfering with itself due to the multiple pathways it can take. So even though the electrons arrive one by one, over time, on average, they accumulate in certain positions, and that's the interference pattern. So I'll be coming back to this double slit experiment shortly, uh, and its connection to the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, and what all of this has to do with the principle of least action and the emergence of classical mechanics. But first, let me say a word or two about going from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic scale. Everyday objects, such as footballs or people or things like that, are not apparently diffracted as they pass through a narrow aperture, such as a doorway, and we don't often see interference effects of mechanical objects on the macroscopic scale. And yet classical macroscopic objects are all made up out of microscopic constituents, atoms and electrons and so on, and these things are governed by quantum mechanics. It is a fundamental requirement of quantum mechanics that we recover the classical mechanics that we observe in the natural world around us when we zoom out. But how do we zoom out? How does classical mechanics emerge? When we say that we zoom out and look at a macroscopic object, what do we mean? We are really studying the collective and possibly emergent behaviour of a very large number of interacting quantum particles, basically 10 to the 23 particles or more. If we had solved the many-particle Schrodinger equation for such a system, we could use statistical mechanics and understand and predict the macroscopic physics. It is a great triumph of modern physics that the rich phenomenology of classical thermodynamics, for example, can be recovered from quantum and statistical mechanics. However, in practice, this can only really be done when we can actually solve the underlying quantum problem. But for many systems, though, we just can't go ahead and solve the many-particle Schrodinger equation for 10 to the 23 interacting particles. It's just too hard. Indeed, understanding the emergent physics from a quantum description of the microscopics is a vast and complex and fascinating field of modern physics called quantum condensed matter physics. There's a whole dedicated lecture course on that. Check out my YouTube channel for more details on that course. But there is a general framework for understanding the connection between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, and that's what I want to talk about now. From this, we'll be able to see why the classical path has the least action from a more fundamental microscopic theory, that is quantum mechanics.
So today I just want to sketch an argument first devised by Richard Feynman in 1942. It is called the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. There's an old story, probably an apocryphal story, about Richard Feynman as a first year freshman student at MIT. He was in a lecture about quantum mechanics and the professor was explaining the double split experiment. The professor showed how the probability of finding the particle at a given point on the screen can be calculated by adding the amplitude of the wave passing through one slit to the amplitude of a wave passing through the other slit. Feynman raised his hand. What happens if you add a third slit in, this, in the barrier? Well, then obviously you add together the amplitude of the waves from all three slits, replied the professor. Just as the professor was then continuing with the lecture, Feynman impertinently raised his hand again. But what if you had four slits or five slits? The professor, becoming a bit impatient with the seemingly inane interruptions, replied, well, obviously you just add the amplitudes of the waves going through the four or five slits. You just add all of the amplitudes, however many slits. Feynman raised his hand. What? asks the exasperated professor. Well, what if you have infinite slits in the barrier so that there's no more barrier? And then what if you put another barrier behind with infinite slits? And it's as simple and as brilliant as that. Feynman had just sketched the basics of what would become the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, one of the most powerful tools ever devised in the subject. You see, if we have a single barrier cut up into infinitely many pieces, the particle can get from the start point to the end point by taking any of these paths, and there's basically an infinite continuum of those paths. The total probability is then the sum of the amplitudes, or the integral of the am amplitudes, uh, for all of those possible paths. But there's much more to it than that. Imagine that you had an infinite number of barriers, each of them cut into an infinite number of slices. I can't draw an infinite number, so let me just draw a few of them. And I can't draw an infinite number of slits, so again, I'll just draw a few of them. But you can basically consider what I've drawn here to be like a discretized version of the continuum limit that Feynman's path integral addresses. So following the same logic, if I want to know the probability that the particle ends up here at the destination, I have to add up the probability amplitudes corresponding to a wave traversing some particular path. But you see, with an infinite number of screens and an infinite number of slits, the particle can really take any possible path. And even if the path looks totally crazy, still it has some amplitude and it contributes to the total probability. And we have to add up the contributions from all possible paths to get the total probability that a particle gets from A to B. In fact, you can also consider paths that go backwards or make loops or do an infinitely many complex things infinitely many times before reaching the destination. All of those paths contribute. But how do they contribute? Uh, how do you calculate the amplitude for each path? Surely these totally crazy paths don't really contribute much. Well, Feynman himself, of course, provided the answer to this, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about now. How do we calculate the amplitude for a given quantum path? Well, let's first remind ourselves what happens with classical waves. The intensity of a wave arriving at a given point is the square of an amplitude. And here I'm just looking at a single wave labeled J, and I've got the square of the amplitude, uh, maybe more precisely, I should say the square modulus, of course, it doesn't really matter whether it be the square or the square modulus, because for classical waves, uh, the amplitude is a real number. So what if we have multiple waves now? Well, now the intensity is simply the square modulus of the total amplitude of all waves at a given point. And the total amplitude is, of course, just the sum of the individual amplitudes for each of the waves j. If there are several waves coming in from different sources, then we get a superposition of the waves, and therefore the sum of the wave amplitudes at a given point. But here's the catch. The intensity at a point is the square modulus of the total amplitude, and therefore we get interference effects because the square of the sum is not equal to the sum of the square. So this quantity on the right-hand side here would simply be the sum of intensities for each of the individual waves, but that's not what we have here. The total intensity is the square of the total amplitude, which is this quantity on the left, and these two are simply not the same. That's why we get interference effects. Okay, but what are these wave amplitudes? 
Well, we can write down a wave equation, and in the simplest case, let's consider a plane wave propagating in the x direction. Then for a given wave j, we have the amplitude aj is just given by some maximum amplitude a0 multiplied by the cosine of uh, the wave number kj for that wave times x minus the angular frequency for that wave omega j times t. So we have spatial position x and time t entering into this equation and it's parameterized by the maximum amplitude a0 the wave number kj and the angular frequency of the wave omega j. And with those numbers that characterize the plane wave propagating in the x direction, we can calculate the, um, the amplitude and therefore we can calculate the intensity. By adding up these various cosines and then taking the square, we'll see interference effects. In particular, we can have waves that are out of phase that exactly cancel each other, giving zero intensity at a given point whilst other waves, which are in phase, reinforce and produce an even bigger intensity at that point than would be obtained by the wave separately. Well, what about quantum mechanics? Well, in quantum mechanics, the probability that a particle starting off at point one, let's say over here, and ending up at a point two, let's say over here, by some particular path, is again the square of a probability amplitude. Let's just call it the probability and given by the square. Let's be more precise now and really say it's the square modulus of a probability amplitude A. But in quantum mechanics, of course, this amplitude is a complex number related to the wave function. Then we take the square modulus, which is then a real number. But what about multiple paths? The total amplitude is then the sum of amplitudes for each possible path for the particle starting off at 1 and ending up at 2. For example, I can imagine this other path, or another path going this way, or even something slightly more crazy like this, where we make some loops and then eventually the particle finds its way to the endpoint number 2. As before, the total amplitude is simply the sum of the amplitudes from the individual paths. So it's exactly the same as for the classical waves, except each path now has a complex amplitude. And if it's a complex number, let's in general say that this complex number aj can be specified by e to the i phi j. This is Euler's famous formula, so I'm writing this the, uh, the complex number here in terms of the phase now, phi j. And for quantum paths starting and ending at fixed points, the normalization of the wave function uh, would imply here that the magnitude is just one, so I've admitted it here. Okay, so what is this phase phi j? Well, let's consider the simplest case of a complex plane wave. In which case, the phase phi j for a given wave can be parameterized again in terms of the wave number kj and the angular frequency omega j. So the propagation along the x-axis is in a straight line with a constant wavelength and velocity and so on. But what do we mean by the wave number k and the frequency omega of a particle? Well, in quantum mechanics, we have, of course, the de Broglie relation, which tells us that the momentum is related to the wave number through uh, Planck's constant h upon 2 pi, h bar here. We also have the Planck-Einstein relation, which tells us how the frequency is connected to the energy, also through h-bar. And so we can write our phase phi in a slightly different way. Let's write it phi as kx minus omega t is equal to 1 upon h-bar 
of px minus e times t. And all of that's for a given wave j. But what about this energy e in here? Well, we're talking about quantum mechanics, and we know that the Hamiltonian gives the energy in quantum mechanics. So for a quantum mechanical plane wave, we have a probability amplitude, aj, for a given wave j, which is e to the i upon h bar, and then now we have the momentum of the particle, pj, times x, minus the Hamiltonian for the particle, hj, times t. And this is true for a plane wave. It has a constant wave number and a constant frequency. In the general case, for some arbitrary path, the probability amplitude for a particle starting at 1 and ending at 2 is not, of course, just given by a plane wave. But what we can do is chop up the motion into tiny, tiny pieces of short duration delta t along the path. And the key idea is that during each short segment along the path, especially as we send delta t to the infinitesimal dt, the phase is roughly constant with a constant k and omega. And therefore, we can imagine the propagation over this tiny time step delta t is a plain complex wave. So over that short time step delta t, we accumulate a small amount of phase difference, which I'm calling here delta phi j. And as before, that's just given as 1 over h bar times the momentum. But this time, the, uh, the difference in the x position, the delta x, minus the Hamiltonian hj times the difference in the time delta t. And of course, we're imagining that delta t goes to zero. So let's factorize out this delta t from that expression. I have 1 upon h bar into pj delta x divided by delta t minus hj. And that's all now multiplied by delta t. But of course, we recognize in here delta x over delta t as we replace all of these by infinitesimals, it becomes dx by dt, which is simply the velocity. Let's call that xj dot. We're just considering motion along the x-axis here for simplicity. So over the whole path from point 1 at time t1 to point 2 at time t2, the total phase difference accumulated is just the sum of the individual delta phi's. And as we consider the continuum limit, where we replace uh, delta t by dt, we can replace these sums by integrals. And this is just going to be 1 over h bar of momentum pj into the velocity xj uh, dot minus the Hamiltonian hj dt. And we integrate over time from the start point at t1 to the end point at t2. So all of this manipulation looks a little bit strange, uh, but actually we see something emerging here that is quite remarkable. Can you spot it? Well, hiding in this equation is the classical Lagrangian for the path j. What is the classical Lagrangian for a given path? Well, we know it can be written in terms of the Hamiltonian through the Legendre transformation that we covered in the previous lectures. And it's equal to pj times the velocity xj dot minus the Hamiltonian. This is nothing to do with quantum mechanics. This is the classical Lagrangian for a given path, by definition. So we have that the total phase accumulated, phi j, is actually equal to 1 upon h bar of the integral of the classical Lagrangian, as I've written it here, lj dt. And remarkably, this is nothing other than the classical action of the path sj divided by h bar. So lurking in the quantum mechanical description is the classical action. Okay, so finally, what is the probability amplitude according to quantum mechanics? <laughs>
for a given path j, this object is denoted aj, and we can now see that it is simply e to the i, and then the action of the path, the classical action, sj, over h bar. So the quantum mechanical phase for a path is just the action in units of h bar. You all knew about the plane wave combination kx minus omega t, I'm sure, but you probably didn't realize that it was actually the action in disguise. Okay, so what about the probability of a particle arriving by that particular path? Well, it's simply the square modulus of the probability amplitude, which we now know in terms of the quantum mechanical phase But of course, this quantity is, by definition, equal to 1. Because when we take the square modulus here, we have e to the i phi j multiplied by its complex conjugate, e to the minus i phi j. The uh, phi's cancel, and we just get 1. And again, this is a consequence of the uh, normalization of the wave function. It's like a conservation of probability condition. So independent of the action, we get the same probability exactly equal to 1 for all paths. All paths, according to quantum mechanics, are in some sense equally likely. Whatever the phase, the probability is equal to 1. In this sense, all paths are equally likely within quantum mechanics. However stupid and crazy and uh, counterintuitive they might be, the particle will take any and all of these classical paths in quantum mechanics. All of them are equally likely. But what does this mean? This is surely completely crazy. Well, not so fast. The point is, we have to consider all possible paths. If all paths are equally likely, then we should consider all of them. So we should really be talking here about the total probability. And now it's the same as the interference problem of classical waves. Because the sum of the square is not equal to the square of the sum, the total probability from all the paths is different from just summing up the probabilities of the individual paths. We have the possibility of quantum interference of different paths, and the quantum interference depends on the phase, which is in turn controlled by the classical action for that path, as we just saw. Now, of course, you know that the quantum mechanical wave function, according to the Born interpretation, is related to the probability of finding a particle at any given point. And so using this probability information here from these probability amplitudes, we can actually reconstruct the quantum mechanical wave function based on the classical paths, weighted according to their classical action. And this is called Feynman's path integral. So we have that the quantum mechanical wave function is related to the classical path labeled j, integrated over all paths j, and weighted by this complex phase here that is itself determined by the classical action for that path j. And so there we have it. In the end, Feynman's path integral is a way of expressing the quantum mechanical wave function in terms of the classical paths, each classical path on its own is in some sense equally likely to occur in the quantum world, but it carries with it a quantum mechanical phase. And because of those, the sum of those contributions with different phases, we get quantum interference. And the amount of quantum interference and the type of quantum interference is determined by the classical action for each of those paths. And then we have to sum over all possible paths because all paths are equally likely in some sense. In the end, we get a quantum interference, which determines the quantum properties of the system. This is a very powerful and beautiful formalism, but we're actually not done yet. The best is yet to come. Using this formalism, we can actually understand how classical mechanics emerges from quantum mechanics. The first thing to realize is that Planck's constant h bar is very, very, very small, 10 to the minus 34 in appropriate units. What this means is that only if the action in units of h bar for a given path j is of order 1 do we have strong quantum mechanical effects. And that's because we have an appreciable phase accumulation, the delta phi, for that path. 
but in the classical world, paths have comparatively large actions. For a given classical path, you could imagine calculating the Lagrangian, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. That's going to be something for a classical path of order joules. And then you uh, integrate that over time, and you get something uh, with units joule seconds for the action. But that's got to be compared with h-bar in this formula, which is 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So small changes in the action for different paths lead to huge, huge phase differences delta phi j for that path. And when we sum up all these contributions from all the different paths, the wildly varying phases just cancel out and we add up to zero. This is destructive interference. So this should be reminiscent of the topic we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, Fermat's principle of least time in optics. So there we had light traveling by different paths. The uh, wavelength of the light is so small that the different path uh, lengths result in uh, drastically varying phase accumulations of the light when it reaches its destination, and that results in destructive interference all of those wave contributions cancel out. But of course, some light does arrive at the destination, according to Fermat's principle of least time. The light is observed to take a particular path, and that path is the one where the neighbouring paths have a small phase difference. And therefore, we get constructive interference, and that's the wave that we see in the end. And so here it's something similar, except the weighting that we use for each of the paths is not the time, but here, the classical action. Imagine that we have three paths from point one to point two. There's this red path A, let's call it. There's this blue path B. And then there's this black path C. We need to calculate the classical action for each of these paths, we have e to the i s a upon h bar. We have e to the i s b upon h bar and e to the i s c upon h bar for the three different paths. Now, these quantities are, of course, complex, and therefore we could depict them as vectors in the complex argand plane. So. Imagine, for example, that we have a vector here for A, describing the real and imaginary parts of this quantity e to the i s a upon h bar. So the x-axis is the real parts, the y-axis is the imaginary part of this object, and this gives some vector in, in this uh, argand plane, which I'm calling A. We have some other vector corresponding to uh, the quantity e to the i s b upon h bar, and then finally some other vector for our path c. And the point is that we can calculate the total contribution uh, according to Feynman's path integral by simply adding up these things. And what we see in this particular example is that we have destructive interference in the sense that when we do the vector addition of these three complex objects, uh, the resulting vector here is extremely small. So this would be destructive interference. And we get that when the three paths are very different from each other, and therefore they have different actions, especially in units of h-bar, that will therefore lead to big discrepancies in these things. They're basically random, and the vector sum ends up being close to zero. Now imagine doing that with um, infinitely many paths. This, uh, this, these random vectors here basically all average out and cancel to zero. But... As with Fermat's principle of least time and the example we discussed at the beginning of optics, here, one path is special. It's the path with the minimum action. The path with minimum action is special because it has neighbours, the similar paths, which have the same action to first order, i.e. ds is equal to zero. That's what we mean by the path with minimum action. 
changes in the action in neighbouring paths are only proportional to ds squared. So the path integral around the path with the least action gives very similar phases, e to the i s upon h bar, and they add up constructively. How does that work? Well, let's consider going from point 1 to point 2 by paths around the path with minimum action. Here I've drawn three possible paths. Let's say the red path here is the one with the least action. Its neighbouring paths, by definition, vary in their action only by a small amount. So let's plot and do the vector sum of these quantities e to the i s a over h, e to the i s b over h, e to the i s c over h bar for these uh, three paths. And because the phases only vary by a small amount, we get something like this in our vector space after the vector addition. And if we consider the resulting total, then we get constructive interference and uh, a large vector line here. This represents constructive interference. And so in the end, this is basically the derivation of the principle of least action known in classical physics. It's really a consequence of the constructive quantum interference around the path with the least classical action and the destructive interference of other paths because h bar is so small. Basically, the world becomes strictly classical as h bar goes to zero. So this is a really profound finding, I think. What we've shown here, what Feynman originally showed, is that we can think of the classical world as a, a limit of the quantum world. The classical paths that we observe and the principle of least action that is equivalent to Newton's second law is actually a consequence of quantum interference of paths around the path with the minimum action. So from very basic principles here, we've basically derived classical physics. So having put classical physics on a, a more fundamental basis, uh, in the rest of the lecture course, we're going to go back to classical physics. We're not going to talk again about quantum mechanics. We're going to talk about the kind of things that happen within the classical world as a, as a consequence of the principle of least action that here we've derived from more microscopic first principles.